In today's video, I have something very exciting that I want to share with everybody. Basically, what this is, is a jig or a way to measure riser flexing. So how much do risers actually flex from brace height to full draw? I'll explain to you why I find this to be important to know, and I'll take you through how I'm going to rate different risers. So that way, this will be a great reference video for all of the videos that will come after this of rating and testing different risers on the market. For those of you that are new here, my name is Jake Kaminsky. I'm a two-time Olympic silver medalist in the sport of archery. I'm working to make this channel a great resource to all types of archery. So if you haven't yet, hit that subscription button and the notification bell. That way you're notified every time a new video is uploaded. I'd appreciate it. Okay, so for a very long time, I've been very interested in the way that risers flex or the lack thereof. Ever since I started working with Doug Denton at Hoyt, you know, back in probably 2010 or so, 2011 for sure, probably 2010, um, you know, he started talking to me about why he designed the GMX the way he did and why it had DFC, which he considered, which he called dynamic flex control. He explained to me, you know, that risers flex and they actually flex quite a considerable amount. And the engineer has to do a really, really good job on controlling how much flex or uh, not that riser has. And so essentially what he explained to me and what I've learned over the years is that these risers actually flex quite a lot while you're actually pulling the bow back. And the they flex in a couple of different ways the main important ways is basically how much do the top and bottom limb pockets flex back towards the archer as they are pulling the bow back and then are they balanced is the top one flexing more than the bottom one or vice versa and then importantly are they flexing in plane in a very direct straight line towards the archer or are they flexing out of plane as you're pulling the bow back now, why is that important? It's important because if the bow flexes perfectly evenly, top and bottom, perfectly straight towards the archer, as you let go, the bow will go from bent, but in an even amount and in and a consistent amount. And then when you let go, it will snap back to its original place at brace height in a controlled manner because there is no out of plane flex. If the riser or the bow flexed out of plane, at full draw, you're aiming in the middle, but as you let go, the bow wants to snap back as it's delivering the arrow, as the limbs are unloading, as it's delivering the arrow towards the target, and that can absolutely cause consistency issues and forgiveness issues. Now, if you take that to the next step and it's flexing unequally top and bottom, as you let go, it wants to rebalance immediately every single time you let go, so it's gonna change what optimal tiller you need, your knock point travel, things like that. So if it's out of plane and unequal, then you've got all sorts of issues to play with. So I've been trying to come up with a way to measure this accurately and consistently. And I've gone through quite a considerable amount of iterations to get to where I am today. So what I did do first was I uh, first drew up a plate. I just call it a riser measuring plate in Fusion 360 and then uh, 3D printed it on the 3D printer I have. So I uh, you know, spent some time to design this to make sure it was a good proof of concept. And then this was going to bolt to where the clicker, I mean, where the arrow uh, rests go, like on the plunger holes, the burger button holes. And then I was uh, basically using a rod that was mounted into the stabilizer bushing hole with a feeler to use a feeler gauge and slide it in between this here. This is a sphere that's uh, drilled and tapped with a 5 24, and then measure that coming off of the plate. I could do it pretty consistent, consistently and it was you know, relatively accurate, but it was really difficult because I couldn't just measure the, the amount of flex towards the archer and the out of plane or in plane flex at the same time because I'd have to measure from here to measure the top bottom flex and then measure from the sides to get the left to right out of plane flex. So after I did this with the 3D printer and had this proof of concept, um, you know, it worked, it worked all right. So I had a, um, a company machine me up a piece of this out of 6065 aluminum or something like that. It's just your basic aluminum anodized, um, hard anodized, I think. And this was gonna be a lot more accurate than the 3D printer. And turns out, as I said, I couldn't measure the out-of-plane flex easily. 
So what I came up with, and after kind of talking to some people and actually hearing about a channel, I don't really know the channel, I don't, I don't watch YouTube anymore, but one of the people I've been working with ta told me about what they do, and they use lasers basically to measure the risers that are flexing and, uh, you know, see torque deflection on a compound. So I figured, oh, I could do that with a recurve. That's a good idea. So what I've got here is a set of basically laser diodes. There's three of them. There's one in the center here that's a central dot. And then the two top and bottom are crosshairs. And so what I will do is I'm going to use the same stabilizer every single time I do this measurement. And I'm going to use, this is just a piece of wood with a hole drilled in it so I can mount it on the end of the stabilizer. And I got a little piece of paper here that I just drew a cross on basically uh, to align the lasers. I will set all of them to be on this cross at brace height. And then I will pull the bow back to a given distance, probably about 28, 29 inches, give or take. And I will mark on the piece of paper with a very fine pencil, you know, a mechanical pencil, where the top and bottom limbs go uh, after it's been drawn back to full draw. And then I'll take this off and I'll use a set of micrometers like this here. Unfortunately, this is a Harbor Freight version and the battery's dead on it. I really need to get a good set of veneer. Uh, dial indicators. Um, I just don't have those right here, but I will be in the future. And um, anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure from this cross hatch here, from this the central line, and measure the deviation in the top and bottom limb flex away from the archer, or towards the archer rather, as they pull back. And then you'll see the crosshairs deviate left and right of center as well, and that'll essentially give us the out of plane flex amount too. So I'm gonna be doing this in a very controlled manner as best as I possibly can. I will use the same set of limbs uh, with the exception of formula bows when I start playing with those. Obviously I can't use this ILF limb on a formula bow, but I'll use the same set of limbs and I will use the same lasers. I'll use the same stabilizer and use the same arrow that I have marked here right towards the end. Um, so that way I can use this mark on this peg as a reference, and I will basically draw it back to the same draw length. I will use my bow scale to measure the draw weight at this length and make sure I have it always set to the same draw weight within a reasonable amount. My goal is to be plus or minus a half a pound. And then I will use a level on the riser, make sure the riser is level, make sure my cross hatch, my, you know, my marks are level as well on the reference paper. So that way when I measure and measure deviation left and right and vertically, I'm getting a very accurate uh, measurement from that and that way I can control it. So it's pretty cool. This here is a little peg that basically that I threaded an adapter to thread right into the plunger hole. So this will be our central reference point and that's pretty stable and consistent and it will be in the same place in every single bow. And then the top and bottom, I just have double-sided tape, really thin VHB tape from 3M that is gonna mount these little pedestals somewhere between the limb bolt and the dovetail mount. Uh, you know, every bow is slightly different. This is a really good consistent location that I can use time after time without any sort of error. And then basically I will take this and mount it on the end of the stabilizer, align my lasers here at brace height after I go through the draw weight measurements and all that, and mark it, take it down, measure my, distance, measure my difference here, and then I will uh, have the ability to post those findings. So before I get too much further into this actual system and setup, I want to make sure that everybody knows out there that I will never do an A versus B comparison. I will never compare this riser to another riser. I'm just not gonna do that type of content. I don't believe that it is uh, gonna be good for the um, archery industry to do that type of thing. Um, but I will be posting some sort of videos or whatever, I don't know, maybe it'll be within my reviews of each of the bows and post my findings. And I may have a database on my website of the, uh, you know, the, the measurements and the results from many different manufacturers. And that way we can, you know, kind of compare and contrast and, and see how these uh, companies are doing. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I'm, I wanted to create more of data-driven feedback, not just, oh yeah, this bow felt great. And, uh, you know, it's got, feels like it's got less vibration. It, 
it feels clean, it feels whatever. Um, you know, those, those are very anecdotal statements and I'm excited to have more hard data-driven um, results to share. So that's always something that I've been trying to figure out and I'm glad I finally have a system. So I've got two cameras here, um, the main one and this other second one here that is just kind of going to give you a secondary view as to what I'm doing. Um, excuse the moving blanket that's on the floor, it really help in, helps uh, dampen the reverberations in this in this room and it makes the audio quality much better for you. So, so yeah, this is a pretty simple little thing, you know, it's just a little laser and uh, it's, you know, powered by a USB cord. So I'll have all those plugged in and, uh, you know, a power bank for another one here. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm really, really actually very excited about this. So this won't always be a hand-drawn mark here. Um, I will usually do this on just some graph paper because it'll be simple to cut and put into place. And I will be taping it in place just because it's an easy, consistent way to put it on and take it off without really damaging anything, distorting the paper. You know, I thought about doing it on a piece of like a white sticker basically, so I could peel it off, but I'd be worried that it'd be stretching it and, you know, distorting the results as I was doing the measurements. So this way, you know, I can just easily tape it on. I thought I had some graph paper in the house. Turns out I do not. Now, on the, all the videos that I'll be doing these type of reviews or this little bit of data, statistics, whatever, I won't go through this whole process every single time. This is just going to be a good reference to, you know, look back on basically and use as a reference if people haven't seen me do this before. So this is just a basic 5 16 24 bolt that'll go in the end of the stabilizer. So as I go through this, it'll, it'll definitely get a little bit more uh, repetitive and easy for myself to have easy, consistent results. But as you can see, you know, it's, it's going to really show itself as to how much this does or doesn't move. But before I set this up, <clears throat> I want to show you how I'll be making sure that I check the consistent draw length. This arrow here that I have a mark on uh, that will basically use on this as a reference as the draw length indicator. So that way I will be able to know how far back I am pulling the bow. So that way I'm not pulling some bows back further than others or others less than not. And that way it's just consistent and really, you know, as accurate and repeatable as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna use the bow scale and get the draw weight measurement zeroed. So I have this hooked in the center of my knocking point just so it doesn't slip up and down. And then I have the arrow hooked underneath the knocking point and I'm gonna draw it back until the mark is on this peg. So this is um, definitely a bit of a pain in the butt right now. Um, what happens is when I get this draw board to start going, uh, the string kind of clunks and moves back and forth so it doesn't draw it back perfectly smooth and the little shock that happens to the bow scale resets it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop back to full draw because I can let it down nice and smoothly and then I'll measure the draw weight because it doesn't matter if it's been zeroed out at full draw or zeroed out at brace height. It measures the same way. It just measures the deviation that the load cell feels on it and it's all pre-programmed into this and it always will work the same. So it doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw back to full draw, zero it, then let it down, look at the scale. So if you see here, this is going to be my mark for full draw and I'm zeroed. I'm just going to make sure we are zeroed on the scale. Let's see if this camera picks it up. Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to let it down and we'll watch the bow weight. It will climb. Hopefully I can do it smooth enough. All right, so we're at 45 and a half pounds here. So that's what I'm going to go for on every single setup is roughly 45 and a half pounds. This particular setup's just, you know, your standard average higher draw weight. 
that you would see, you know, on your, on the international scale, you'd see much higher draw weights than that. But I feel like for the general public, 45 and a half pounds is pretty good. It's pretty, uh, pretty much a good measurement to use that everybody can relate to. So now I'm going to get this thing kind of jigged up at brace height. So I've got it just a little bit of pretension to just have it, you know, uh, stabilized by the actual system. I've got this uh, Hamsky third axis level that'll be a nice reference to use on the sight window as my level, my level here. So I can adjust that, play with that, and I can adjust my canting and my level here on my bow press itself. So now my bow is level and I'll use this short little level here to level my main line and then clamp it down with you know an allen wrench. So my vertical is level here on this bubble and my third axis is level here. Let me double check, I'll hold this on here. Yep, so both my bubbles are level. So I'm going to do that every single time. It's set in place. Now I can put on my dot and then I can focus the beam and make sure that it's the smallest dot that I can possibly make it. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this secondary camera here so you can see what I'm doing with the lasers up close. And just know that what I'm going to do is I will take this arrow again and I will clip it on the string like this because I have the knocking point exposed and I will draw it back to that same mark that we used to check the draw weight. So that will make sure that I'm getting the bow back to a consistent draw length. I'm gonna reset the camera here and then we'll get back together. All right, so I've got the camera now set up again and you'll see that I am going to be able to adjust this laser manually by hand because I haven't found a micro adjustable one of these. And I will absolutely do my best to try to get this in the dead center of the crosshairs on both of them. Right, so that's pretty close to the center of that crosshair. It's a little distorted on the camera here because it, the lasers are so bright to the camera. Um, but it's a really definitive central dot for, at least for what I see. So now I'm always going to put them in the same manner, <clears throat> top and bottom. The little laser will be on the top side, on the top, and on the bottom, on the bottom. And then I will just angle them towards the actual uh, dot here and you'll see it's a crosshair it's pretty cool Let me make sure it's focused too now these don't have to be perfectly uh, aligned vertically or horizontally really all I'm interested in is the pinpoint and I like the crosshair because I think I can get a bit more accurate location of that dot looks pretty good to me and as you can see, it doesn't matter. As I'm gonna pull the bow back, it's gonna kick and rock and move. This is not changing the laser. It's still in the center, still aligned. Doesn't matter if it's canted or not. I totally bumped it on the, the handle here, so I gotta remove it or readjust this. And this central one is probably redundant. It's probably a bit unnecessary because I mean, honestly, the stabilizer and the plunger probably shouldn't move all that much because that's, you know, you're generally, most risers are solid through that center port, center part, so it's not gonna move all that much. But I think it'll be interesting. Maybe we'll find something that really moves and we'll be able to see it. But, uh, you know, now that I have the crosshair drawn on here, it's not really as important, but it still is a good reference, I think. And then this bottom one, I'll just plug into this power bank because I don't have another USB plug handy. So I know it's a little chaotic here because there's a lot of lasers going around <laughs> and uh, many different directions. I probably could just rotate this one to make it an X instead of a cross because then it'll be easier to differentiate the top from the bottom, just visually speaking. So right now I'll do the top with an X, the bottom with a cross. So if anybody out there knows of micro adjustable diode holders, this would make this project and this thing here so much easier and a lot faster. 
Let me know if you know of any micro adjustable diode holders. Put a link in the description below, please. Or if you have a couple kicking around in your shop and you don't use them anymore, there is a PO box in the description below and I would be ever grateful if someone were to send me something cool. All right, so this is looking pretty close. I mean, I'm not gonna be able to get that any closer. You know, the bottom one has a bit of an odd distortion to the vertical axis here. It's, uh, it's got a double width, but the bright one is in the center. So again, it's kind of hard to see because the camera, you know, the laser is just so bright. I turned the exposure down on it, so hopefully it'll pick it up okay. But anyway, I'm ready to draw this bow back and get our very first demonstration of what actually happens as I'm pulling this bow back or as the machine's pulling the bow back. So uh, I might have to adjust the camera as I'm starting to pull it back because the bow will rock backwards just slightly as it starts to draw. So let's get into it. All right, so it's, it moved up. I want you to see this because it's, it's pretty cool. All right, so I got my mark here on this peg, which is consistent with my draw length. The bow is at full draw. Uh, I forgot to measure, just out of curiosity, what kind of draw length this is being pulled back to. 30 inch draw length, so um, I guess the 29 was close. So 30 inch draw length. Um, and as we can see, that top one has deviated vertically because the bow has flexed back towards the archer. And the bottom one has deviated down, which means it's flexed back towards the archer. Oddly enough, I might have bumped this one here as I pulled it back because it's a little high. Um, could be, could have bumped here. I'll recheck it and we'll do it over really quick. But you can definitely see that it is deviated. I, I mean, a couple mils, top and bottom. And it looks like the top is actually flexed more than the bottom from that central point. Uh, again, it could be due to the stabilizer actually flexing, not the stabilizer itself, but the riser flexing through the stabilizer area. And uh, so I'm going to quick go back to brace height, make sure that it didn't bump this out of place and restart just in case. Okay, so back to brace height. The bow is pretty much unstrung, or not unstrung, but back to brace height. And that's pretty wild. I don't know, yeah, you, sh you can see that. If I cover the top and bottom, you can see the arrows back to the center of that cross section. So um, we're gonna have to do a couple of different measurements then and give a bit of data. I don't know what I'm gonna label them as, and I will figure that out, but I will do a measurement here um, because everything is back to the crosshairs. It's back to the drawn crosshairs that is marked on this actual stabilizer reference. So I will redraw the bow back to the same draw length. I will mark all three and then I'll take it off and I will measure the amount of deviation from that. And again, like I said, I'll probably post some sort of results on my uh, website or something along those lines. It's this is this is really exciting for me because being able to visually see and visually reference how much these bows are flexing is insane. I I as a really high level shooter think that think it's important, but if you ask just about anybody out there, forgiveness is more important to your average everyday shooter. I used to be a high level shooter. I should re you know re. Uh, restate that statement because it's not true. I'm not a high level shooter anymore. I'm more of your, you know, your upper level local club pro type of score shooter. Um, but I've shot a lot of stuff in the past and, uh, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm genuinely excited about this. So So I got it really close with the drawboard and then clicked the actual uh, 
power press to get it to be really, really consistent within one millimeter of the mark that I've got on this arrow. So then I'll take this here and I'm gonna mark the stabilizer mark, the lower mark, just a little off on that. And then the upper. Now I'm gonna try to hold this by hand so you guys can see what's going on. There's the upper right on that dot, the central right on that dot, and the lower right on that dot. All right, so the dots are very, they're tiny. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm always going to, I'm always going to take three measurements with my micrometers and measure to the center of the dot from the center of the X and the deviation uh, vertically left and right or vertically up and down, horizontally left and right and post my findings as far as what kind of deviations will be happening. So I'm going to let this bow down because to be honest, it's a bit terrifying and I probably should have taken the arrow out. Um, I will from now on because <laughs> uh, it's a little terrifying watching a bow be at full draw even though a machine's holding it. Stuff happens, accidents happen. That's a genuine mistake that I never should have done. I should not have put my head down in front of that arrow. I, I, got, I got lucky, I guess. A little too excited, I think. Maybe I'll use a, uh, <clears throat> a tape measure instead of using an arrow for my draw length checker. That'd probably be a little safer. Um, but that's really wild. I've never, I never would have imagined it'd be that much of a change I mean, I think it's pretty wild. This is a is a huge, huge movement compared to what I would have expected. So, um, you know, I'm holding my finger here in front of the camera as a reference, so you can see the amount of change. And I mean, it is it is a large amount of change. I wouldn't be like discouraged if you're a you know a viewer and you've got a GLO GT or something like that, because trust me, they all move, um, and some move a lot, some move a little. Some really move off plane and some don't. It's it's very interesting and this is why I'm so excited is, you know, because we'll really get to see who's doing their engineering or not and doing their due diligence properly because the, right now, just offhand, what I can see, the upper limb pocket flexed five and a half millimeters vertically and the lower pocket only flexed three millimeters vertically. So in inches, that's... Uh, three six seven thirty seconds you know so pretty you know i'm trying to really give you details here and the bottom flex about an eighth of an inch so that's a big difference so seven thirty seconds compared to four thirty seconds seven thirty seconds versus four thirty seconds that's a big difference deviation left and right you know about a sixteenth of an inch on that top pocket which is really close to about a millimeter and about a half a mil or so on the bottom to the, to the left. Um, so what that showed to me is if this was the top pocket here, and I'm gonna over exaggerate, it's flexing like this away from the, or towards the archer rather, and giving a vertical deviation, totally be, to be expected, but it's also doing this as well. It's, tor it's torquing or twisting and shifting towards the left. The bottom is doing this, is uh, <clears throat> doing this rather. It's flexing down and away from the archer, or excuse me, down and towards the archer, away from the plate. I'll get used to this eventually. And it is also deviating slightly this direction and twisting and torquing slightly this direction, at least relative to the actual stabilizer, because again, this is mounted on the stabilizer. <clears throat> but if I look and compare the two top and bottom uh, pockets compared to where the actual uh, st you know the the arrow mount was here in the center where the actual arrow would be you can see all three deviated slightly to the left so the stabilizer moved potentially this way towards the right so therefore it didn't really actually move all that much that direction so I will probably give I'm not sure yet. I have to kind of take some measurements, many different measurements, because I got to measure from the stabilizer deviation where this cross line is here, where the arrow deviation is, and where the top and bottom limb deviations are 
from something. I will probably use the arrow as your central reference point because that's honestly what's the most important thing. Who really cares, I suppose, if the stabilizer is moving? I didn't expect the stabilizer to move different from the arrow all that much, but it moved a considerable amount. Um, you know, about half as much as the bottom pocket did and, you know, about a quarter as much as the top pocket did. So it is interesting. I'm in the discovery phase as well, so this is exciting to me. If you do have any suggestions, any suggestions on how to make this more accurate, more consistent, obviously micro adjustable uh, diode holders would be better um, and a clamp that would clamp this in space and wouldn't move, but this is what I'm working with. This is what I have and I tried to mitigate as many factors that would change as possible. You know, I leveled the bow, leveled the plate, uh, drew the bow back, you know, after getting all my measurements all squared and tried to get as much consistency as possible. And that's gonna be my goal. So if I miss something, please comment below. Let me know if you have any suggestions, any feedback, any ideas, comment below. I would love to know what you think about this and if you're as excited about it as I am. Probably not. Most people would really just roll their eyes and say, I don't understand why that's relatively important at all. But again, like I said, I think that really seeing how the top and bottom limb pockets flex towards the archer and if they're out of plane or not, is going to affect the way that arrow is delivered. Because as you pull back and full draw, it's in that bent position. And as the limbs are unloading and delivering the arrow, they're going to want to go back to where it was at brace height. And if it's changing a whole lot, it's gonna change the knock path, the knock travel. And yes, it'll do it consistently. It will, absolutely. But what's gonna happen is if that arrow is doing this and the knock path is doing this or doing this or something different, right? And it's doing it every single time different. If you shot a perfect shot, it would go in the middle every single time, no doubt about it. But we're all humans. We're not shooting machines. We're not a machine that's pulling the bow back. And so what will happen is Say if the knock went up initially every single time and then it came back down as the as the you know arrow was kind of being delivered by the bow. When you shot and you made a mistake where you'd maybe make that arrow want to rise vertically, you make a change in your finger pressure and now the arrow is really moving up and then coming down and it's bouncing off the rest or vice versa because I don't know which way it would affect it. But if you made that vertical mistake up, you may either really throw that arrow extra high or it may be very forgiving in the vertical fashion, but then in the, the downward vertical fashion, when you make a mistake low, it may really make a big difference. Um, or like I said, vice versa. It's hard to say, hard to isolate, really almost impossible to isolate without sitting there and machining risers and having them flex wrong on purpose and then testing them to see how it goes. This is, this is exciting. Um, I, I, I'm excited. So I hope you are. Um, again, I did it on a piece of paper so I could take this off. I could catalog it. I can actually write this here. And I will always mark what it is. This is a 27 inch GLO GT, all right? So I will always have these marked. Again, I'll probably have some sort of database online because I, would, I think it'd be really cool to track this stuff over time. This hasn't been done before, to my knowledge, at least publicly with a recurve. So to see what would potentially happen over the years um, in the archery industry might be pretty cool. These bows might get better and better because this data is going to be out there now. You know, I, I think it would be great to see. Let's compare bows from uh, 2000. I've got an, a Hoyt Axis here in the cabinet. I'll pull that out and do it with this because I think it'd be funny. Uh, you never know. I don't know, that might be really good for all I know. Um, you know, how do bows flex from the 2000s to the 2020s? You know, or how do Asian bows versus American bows versus Italian bows versus I don't know, wherever else bows are made and see who's got their, you know, their ducks in a row and who's doing their due diligence because this isn't gonna lie. This is real hard proven data and I'm excited, so. I hope you're as excited as I am, and if not, sorry. <laughs> I don't know, I'll shoot some more for you. Maybe that'll get ex excited, shoot some more bare bow. Uh, but anyway, like I said, please comment below if you have any suggestions, any ideas, any feedback, anything I missed, anything I messed up. You know, I'm human, and uh, this is a dry run. Not really, I've done a million of them with all the other products that I've tried measuring with, and this is gonna be the easiest way for me to control the entirety of the system. But anyway, 
Uh, excuse my giddiness, but uh, this is exciting. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, consider hitting the subscription button and the notification bell, as well as the like button. I would appreciate it. Also, please consider supporting my channel. If you head to my website, jakekaminski.com, there'll be info and links on Patreon, apparel, books, and equipment sales, PayPal donate button, a PO box to send things to, and above all else, please share this video because there's no better advertising than word of mouth.